best friends in the world. Uh, we've been in ministry together for almost 31 years. Uh, he started, moved into a neighborhood. He, he saw like the outliving of this whole concept of relocation. Uh, he was born in Iowa, probably hadn't seen many black people until he went to Wheaton College. And, uh, and then felt call of God, he felt call of God at an early age to live in the community. So he got his teacher's certificate after college and moved into the community and started a Bible class with uh, 15 young people. He and, his, he and his wife, soon after, he moved there. And they began a development there is one of the outstanding developments uh, of the United States in the word of the United States, and uh, he started with those 15 people. They have a worshiping congregation every Sunday morning with two services of about 1,200 people there, and uh, uh, it, it and and there is nearly 300 who have gone off to college and university from that. Uh, they said it was the 16th poorest community in America, and uh, and uh, we, we've had almost 300 young folks who are went out to college, relocated, come back in that community. Uh, they have a health service there that's serving over 200,000 uh, people uh, a year and all other kind of development there and it's anchored within the local church. If you're ever in the United States, I want you to come there and do it. He is the, he is the uh, what I call it, and people try to give that to me, the idea of uh, in, uh, leading indigenous leadership developer. I think I, my role would be, is, might be the leading person who talks about it and tries to inspire other people to get involved in it and then help them a little bit laying the foundation for it. But when it comes to the essence of really strengthening and raising up indigenous leaders which is inherited in the Great Commission which is inherited in the Great Commission and so the points that I was making here in terms of relocation reconciliation redistribution we have set that in a form of what we call the eight key components. and so he's going to include those into into his uh, into his teaching and then probably when I come back we will do more in terms of question and answers because we're getting so many questions now about what we are talking about. That's all I want to do, just set the stage. Well, it is, uh, it is really a great joy to be here with you. And uh, I am, I'm excited to be of what's going on here. And as, as uh, Dr. Perkins has said, you know, um, 36 years ago, I sensed a call of God to move into an all African American, and all black community on the west side of Chicago, got a job teaching and coaching at the local public high school. And as I was a teacher and a coach at the public high school, started a Bible study with some high school students, and uh, many of them were starting to become Christians, but they weren't going to church. And so we started thinking about, well, you know, let's study the church. So I got married, and my wife and I, we had a little weight machine, and kids came over and lifted weights. Because at the school, we didn't have that. The school had no facilities. We had no practice field, no place. I coached American football, we, and I also coached wrestling. And we just didn't have the facilities, and I taught history. And so we uh, had the kids come over, and uh, we bought a weight machine. They came over to a storefront. We bought a storefront, lived upstairs in a little four-room apartment in this neighborhood. The first night we ate, our house got broken into, and we lost everything we had. And, and many times people thought, well, that was it. And I, and I remember saying to my wife that night, maybe, honey, maybe we made a mistake. Because people said you can't, as a, I, as a white man I was living there, but you can't bring a white woman to live in this neighborhood. 15th poorest neighborhood in America. It's, it's when you think of American poverty and you think of American inner cities, this is it, North Lawndale. William Julius Wilson, a black sociologist from Harvard University, used to be at the University of Chicago, has coined the phrase in America what we call the permanent underclass. Unfortunately, we have built a permanent underclass in America, and, I'm, I, and my assumption from the little bit I know here about Jamaica, you have that same thing here in Jamaica. Probably more people percentage-wise here in Jamaica than we have in the United States. 
United States. And, and a lot of it is that we have never. John Perkins and I just read a book. I, I would highly recommend it. I think it would transfer to Jamaica, but it's called Brainwashed. And it's African-American in Chicago who wrote this book about how black people in America have been brainwashed and, 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 and brainwashed to think that they're not created in the image of God. Brainwashed to think they're not as good as white people. And he traces it all the way back to slavery and how to help with that. It's a, it's a one, John and I teach a, a, a doctoral course. We run a doctoral program in Chicago. And in our doctoral class we just taught a couple weeks ago, we, we had our students read this and we had some great discussion about it. And so here we got broken into in our family and as we began, I remember getting down that night and everybody told me don't bring a wife to live in this neighborhood, the high violence and things of that nature, besides the poverty that was there. And my wife, I said to her, honey, I think maybe we made a mistake. Maybe we shouldn't live here. And she said, honey, I love you and I want to live there. Now, um, I never gave her a second chance. We got broken into ten times in the first three years of our marriage. I didn't give her those chances the rest of those. Anyway, so that's the context uh, that I'm coming. You know, one of the things you really need to know about CCDA is that we are not experts. We have an annual conference in, Chica uh, in, in the United States. Listen, past year we were in Chicago, over 3,000 people who are living among the poor and working among the poor in America come to our conferences. And one of the things that we help people to think and know is that there is, there's nobody that's an expert. We don't view Dr. Perkins as the expert. We view him as a practitioner, someone who's been doing this, and, and that's what we all are. And people don't view me that way or others, is that we are all just sharing our story and learning together. And so that's what we're here, here in Jamaica to do. We're not here to tell you how to do anything. But there is a proven way that, 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 that works. And um, we'll get the wrong thing on there if I'm not careful. But anyway, there's a, there's a proven way of how uh, you can do ministry among the poor. And we call it Christian community development. And, and your, your theme here of restoring at-risk communities is exactly what that is. And so I, I, what I want to do today is I, uh, uh, and John and I, are, we, we tag team all the time. We've been to 100 cities together in America. So we're used to doing this. We changed the schedule a little bit. Sorry about that. If you're one of those people that got to have it in order that it is written down, if it's if you're one of those, you're going you're gonna to get mixed up today. And uh, I think we got a handout that's going to be coming out pretty quickly that they're running off that will help you with some of the things that I'm talking about. So you'll have those actually in your notebook. But Christian community development is, 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 is what it is, 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 is it's, a, it's a philosophy, okay? It's a philosophy of ministry to reclaim and restore under-resourced communities. Now, we don't like to talk too much about poor communities in America. I don't walk around my neighborhood, even though it is over half the people in my neighborhood, and there's about 60,000 people and, uh, that live in my neighborhood. I still live there. My wife there for 36 years. We've raised our children there. Our kids have all gone on to college and university. They've all moved back to Chicago, moved back to the city. And the city of Chicago actually is probably a little bit of a microcosm of Jamaica. The same amount of people that live in Jamaica, live. In, we have actually a little bit more of you just in the city limits of Chicago. We've got about 3 million people live in the city limits of Chicago, and then we've got about 6 million that live in the suburb. We've got about 9.5 million people in the Chicago area. And so what we, what, as we live out this, our children, as we've, they've grown up and lived in this environment, have found it to be something that they could be nurtured. And they all love the Lord and they all care about hurting people. But now, Christian community development. The, very, the most important letter for you to understand on the slide that's here is the word, is the word A. A philosophy. <clears throat> Christian community development is not the only way to attack poverty. In America, we've had lots of different, from model cities programs and urban renewal programs, but almost every program, uh, we had a war on poverty. We've had lots of programs in America, and almost every one of them have failed. Now, Christian community development is a philosophy. We don't, we don't stand here tonight, today and say that this is the only way you can help poor people to come out of their poverty and to find a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's other ways to do it, but it's a philosophy. It's a philosophy that we found, and it started in Mississippi with John Perkins. John Perkins, as he shared last night, and he shared a little bit this morning, and we want to make sure we get more of his story out. So sometimes when I'm here and he's not telling the story, I'll feed 
him, I'll feed him a story to tell. Because his story is so important. Because God, he, he left Mississippi, he left Mississippi because of violence. His brother was killed in a racial incident. He, he was struggling there in Mississippi, and he left to California. He, he got out. God called him to himself first. And John became a Christian through his four-year-old son, Spencer. And then God called him back to go back where he said, I don't ever want to go back to Mississippi. He had a good job, doing well, raising his family out in California. Things were good. But God said, no, I want you to go back and live among the people that you came from, and I want you to love them. That's all he knew to do. So he went back down to Simpson County and New Hebron and Mendenhall and Jackson, Mississippi, and began to love the people there. And out of that... The philosophy that we now call Christian community development began to evolve. The first were the three R's. And then as the three R's evolved, now they've now evolved into the eight key components. And there's, there's literally dozens and dozens of ministries like what I'm going to talk to you about today, Lawndale. That's my church, Lawndale. The neighborhood is North Lawndale. You Google it, it'll tell you all about it. We have violence. It's still very violent. Just, I've just this in the last month, we buried two of our young men in our church that were shot and killed. It's, 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 heart, it's, it's heart-wrenching, the struggle. And so if you're in that environment, let me, know, let me let you know that I empathize with you and I feel for you on that. And it's hard and it's difficult. But this philosophy of restoring and reclaiming under resource, which is our code word for poor, because we don't want to walk around and tell everybody you're poor. You know, I don't walk in our church and say, oh, that you all are poor, even though most of the people in our congregation are. They live below the poverty rate. But we don't want to label people. We want to help people to come out of their poverty. And so the philosophy of ministry, it's a philosophy. You may think, you may not agree with it, there may be some, but, but in order for it to work, you need to do all eight of them. And that's, that's what we tell people in the United States all the time. There's eight, there's eight different aspects to this philosophy. Just to give you the context, we're going to show you a video right now of, of, of Lawndale Community Church. So uh, what I want to do now is do a quick overview of the eight key components with you and to help you uh, to get a thought of that. Now, the first one John talked about is relocation. John re is the first relocator. He was back in uh, California, and God called him to relocate back to his community, back to the one he wanted to get away from. And so John uh, came back to California. And, and this, is, this is based on the incarnational ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things I heard John say earlier this morning and that we often talk about is that the philosophy of community development comes straight from the Bible. It's a biblical philosophy. And, and we are unashamedly Christian in our name, the Christian Community Development associate. We're not a bunch of do-gooders or out there just people doing good works and then slap on the name of Jesus on that. No, we are Christians doing uh, Christian community development, loving our neighbor as we love ourselves in our community. And so uh, the first thing that you see there is that we live in the community. And, and again, it's based on the incarnational ministry of Jesus Christ. And the incarnation is, is, is the Christmas story from John, is in John is a lot different than it is in Luke. Luke, you know, we have the manger and the baby being born and all those things. But what do we see in, um, in the Gospel of John? It says, John 1.1 1, 1 is a great verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so God is in the very beginning. But then you zip down to verse 14, that's the Christmas story. Verse 14 is the Christmas story in the Gospel of John. And what is it? The Word, who's the Word? The Word is God. And the Word became flesh... And, and sometimes we translate it, dwelt among us, lived among us, pitched his tent among us. Jesus left heaven and came to earth and lived among us. You know, God had it all together. He was living in the plush and the plush pleasurable place called heaven. And he had everything going. But he says to his father, I need to go down there and help and live among the people. And that's what he did. And of course, you know that from Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus Christ, and that the attitude that we're to have, we're to be like Christ. The attitude that we have is that we might be like Christ, who, 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 can, who was considered equality with God. He was equal with God. But it says there in Philippians 2, did not count equality with God something to grasp, something to hang on to, but he emptied himself and became a human being and came to earth, even was obedient to the Father, even to the point of death. 
And so living people, God himself came and lived among his creation and guided us and has shown us. And now we study the Gospels and we watch. And of course, Christ died on the cross for us. And so living in the community. And, and, and this afternoon, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you create ghettos. And we'll look at that. But what happens is that when, when all the people of skills move out of where poor people live, in America, it may have happened a little bit differently than it happened in Jamaica. I don't know the Jamaican story. I'm certainly not an expert on Jamaica. That's just what you need to apply this then. But what I think would, what happened in America is that, you know, before in the 1960s when Dr. King was alive, we, we had before that, after the Civil War and after slaves in America were free, we had this long thing called the Jim Crow laws. And that black people did not get treated the same as white people. Drinking fountains, you've probably seen movies where it's whites only and then colored it was called. And so all of that was taking place. And then in the Civil Rights Movement in America in 1964, uh, the Civil Rights Legislation was, was signed. And for the first time, black people in America could actually move into other areas. And, 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 and housing was no longer the civil rights. The housing law said you cannot segregate people by and discriminate against people by the color of their skin. And so what happened is that up until 1965, all the black people lived in neighborhoods like North Lawndale. And North Lawndale was not as poor and was not as crime ridden in 1965 as it is today. What happened was is that many of the African American people who had good jobs, who had skills, we had doctors, we had bus drivers, we had school teachers, we had lawyers that all lived in this quote unquote ghetto. But we watched people, we watched people go to work every day. But then when people with skills who could get a chance to get out. And there's, it's very complicated in America. I mean, there were actually laws that our federal government had that made it that, that this American person in Chicago that might want to buy their own home, they couldn't buy their own home. You, on the GI Bill, they couldn't get it in Chicago. They had to go to a suburb. They had to leave. And so what happened, and William Julius Wilson, this, this African-American sociologist at Harvard today, he studied what happened and he called, that's how we create in America the permanent underclass. You might need to do a little work on why are people poor? Why is there this disparity in Jamaica? Why do we have some wealthy people? Why do we have middle class? And why do we have poor people? I don't know why it goes on in Jamaica. There, there, one of the reasons it happened in America was a negative effect of a positive legislation. And so what happened then is that we had communities that didn't have anybody got up. And the mother, the, the father was not in the home. 90% uh, of the kids born in my neighborhood born without a father in the home. The breakdown of the family is a struggle. And then when that happens, and so when we, when we, then when we relocate, so when I moved back into the neighborhood, when I moved into North Lawndale, even though my, I'm a white person in an African-American community, it was a start of a little bit of hope. But then we've helped over 200 kids go off to college and graduate and move back into our neighborhood. African-American doctors, African-American lawyers, African-American business people now have come back and live in North Lawndale. That's why I can be here with you today in Jamaica. I don't do anything back in Chicago anymore. The people do it all. I just get to have fun. <laughs> but you see, what, what happens then is a little bit of the reweaving the community. Now, it's hard. It's hard. This is the one, you know, some of you here in Jamaica are going to say, oh, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. I spent my whole life getting out of poverty areas. It ain't no different in America. This is the hardest one for black people to do, white people to do, Mexican people to do. It's the hardest one for all of us. But the question is, are we obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ? And this is a philosophy of ministry that is based on the example of what Jesus did. Now, I've been there 36 years, and I've had a couple sabbaticals. We've moved out of the neighborhood a couple times so that, that we could be refreshed. I wrote a, I've written a few books, but one of them, we don't have them here, but it's, it's called Real Hope in Chicago. And the first five words of the book, if, if you, if you want to, I'll, I'll tell you what the book's about. First five words of the book says, I love living in Lawndale. I love it. And then I tell 20 chapters of stories, and in case you missed the point, 
the last five words of the book are the same. I love living in London. I can tell you, I wake up every morning, and I can't believe I have the privilege to do the things that God's called me to do. It's a wonderful thing. Now, in Lawndale, we have the three R's of living in Lawndale. We call it the relocators. That's somebody that's not indigenous to the community that moves into the neighborhood. The second one are the returners, those young people that go off and get some skills, go off and get to college. Maybe they live away in the suburb for, for 10 years or 20 years, and then they move back. Those are the returners. But then we also have the remainers. There's some people in the poorest areas of Jamaica that love the Lord Jesus Christ. When you go, God doesn't show up, all right? That's a very important part for us to know. God's been there. God always has. The biblical motif is God always has a remnant that's there. There are people who've remained, like Mrs. Moore, who was on the screen. She never left North Lawndale. She never owned her own home until she was 70 years old. You saw her shaking the hand of somebody. She has her own home. We helped her get her own home. She owns her own home. She has grandchildren that live with her there now, and it's a wonderful opportunity. So this is the first one, relocation, living in the community. The second one, then, is reconciliation. This is the evangelism piece, and that you, you can't be reconciled with somebody else unless you're reconciled back to God. Some people say we don't have, we don't, in, in CCDA, we don't have an evangelistic philosophy. Oh, yes, we do reconciliation, and that God, that Christ was, that was in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, reconciling the world back to himself. And so when we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that Christ died on the cross for us to reconcile us as sinners who, who have struggled and fall short of the glory of God, and God brings us back into relationship. But then we've got to start breaking down racial barriers. And so we begin to do that, and that's person to person. We, we are to be reconciled across racial lines and other lines. That, that what, what divides us? Anything that divides us, God wants to reconcile us as his people. And then, and then thirdly, people group to people groups. We've got to work at that. Blacks and whites and Hispanics and Latinos and Asians. In America, we've got lots of issues and lots of problems, not just the black-white problem in America, although we've clearly never solved that yet either. <clears throat> so this is reconciliation. I'm going through these relatively fast. John will probably talk more about that one tomorrow. Then redistribution. What happened was, in impoverished communities, really often, we find out that there's nothing left. In fact, in my neighborhood, for the first, for the first uh, 25 years I was there, you couldn't, you couldn't buy a pair of shoes. No shoe store in the neighborhood. You, you couldn't buy clothes. You couldn't buy groceries. None of these places locate. They all left. And when we had our riots, and in America, we in the 60s, was a time of racial strife in America. And when, when African Americans were working to get uh, what we would call their equal rights and be able to be seen as human beings, the classic sign is a black man in Alabama holding up a sign that says, I am a man. I'm a human being. I'm created in the image of God. Well, during that time, all the businesses left. All the white businesses left the white, the African-American community, and there's nothing left behind. No sit-down restaurant in our community where you can sit down and have dinner at night with your family. None. I mean, I could just go on and on about all the things that weren't there. Redistribution is to start to bring back some of those things. You've seen we opened a health center. We've, op we, we've opened a couple restaurants. We, we've built a fitness center. We've got gyms. We've, we've done a lot of things, and we use all of them to win people to Christ, but we use all of them to help people to begin to get their lives on track. And so this is the redistribution, is bringing back things. What are needed in the, hip in the, in the poorer communities? And... Then we do it. Now, leadership development. You know, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not that smart. But it didn't take me too long to realize that a white man shouldn't be in charge of running all this stuff in an African-American black community. And I needed black leaders. I needed black leadership. And so I went around to all my educated black friends in America, that people I went to college with and people that I got to know and other teachers at the local public school, and I tried to get them to come and, and join me. I said, I don't even want to be the pastor. You come pastor. I'll be a deacon. You know, but we need, we need black people. And Evan said no. And I'm not, I'm not faulting any of them. You know, I, I believe they prayed and, just got, and, and it was God's plan because had they come, it would have maybe made it too easy. And one day I'm talking to Tom Skinner. Now, you may not know the name. He's an African-American, grew up in New York City, in Harlem of New York. And I'm talking to Tom Skinner, and I said, Tom, Tom had been a mentor of mine. And I said to Tom, his first book I read in 1970, it's called Black and Free. 
And he wrote, when he wrote that book, out of his experience growing up in Harlem. So I'm talking to Tom, and I said, Tom, I can't get any black, I don't have any black leadership here. I've been here for three or four years now, and, you know, it just looks, it looks like apartheid in South Africa that I'm in charge, you know, and this just isn't good. I need black leaders. And, and he said, oh, no problem, Wayne. He said, the problem is you've been looking in the wrong place. I said, okay, he's going to give me the hookup. You know, uh, he's going to go to Morehouse and Howard and, and, and all the African-American schools in Chicago, I mean, in America that we could go to, and he's going to give me people because he had ministries on all these campuses. So I'm ready for him to give me the hookup. And he says, he said, well, Wayne, here, let me tell you, you're looking in the wrong place. He said, the leaders for Lawndale are already here. They're here, and now what God brought you to Lawndale to do is to raise up a new generation of black leadership for this neighborhood. He said, that's what you got to do. That's why God brought you as a white man into this neighborhood. And then he grabbed me by the arm, and he, he was a big man. He was the chaplain for the Washington Redskins football team, and he was a big man. And he grabbed me by the arm, and he squeezed, and he looked at me, and he said, but Wayne, he said, there is one catch to this. And I said, okay, what, what's the catch? He said, it's going to take you at least 15 years to do that. And then only as Tom Skinner could do, he looked me dead in the eye. That $64,000 question. He said, Wayne, will you stay in Lawndale for 15 years and raise up a new generation of leadership? And I said, Tom, I'm going to stay 15 years. That 15 doubled to 30, and now it's already up to 36, and I ain't no way tired. I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. But it takes that time. And, and leadership development is, is what you would call, uh, it, it's, it's discipleship. The man on the video that said his head weighed 85 pounds, he just got a Master's of Divinity. He's the executive pastor at Lawndale Community Church, and he's working on a doctorate right now. And he's leading while I'm gone. That young man up there that you, that you saw his name, Jojo. Jojo was one of those high school kids who, who had the idea to start the church. He's still with us. He's the director of that Hope House ministry. He was hooked on drugs himself for many years. God delivered him. Now he's back. Started a house. 50 men. He's helped 2,000 men get off drugs. And Jojo was there. Never went to college. Didn't go to seminary. So we set up our own seminary to help him get a degree. He got a certificate this week. He's an associate pastor at Lawndale Community Church. We've got doctors. We've got lawyers. We've got people. Edgy. My own three kids went off to college and have all come back. I'm telling you, if you commit yourself to raising up a new generation of leadership, you can do it. But you got to realize, do you want the quick fix of the problem, or do you want to do it over the long haul and take 15 years, see 15 years into the future for these young kids that are running around in impoverished neighborhoods here in Jamaica? Bring them into your house. Let them know. And I'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon. Then church-based. I mean the church. I'm going to do a whole session on church-based uh, development this afternoon, so I'm not going to hit that much, but it's, it, that's what keeps us centered. The church is God's change agent for the community. John already quotes tonight, Matthew 16, that God, God, God gave us the church. He says to Peter, you are the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. The church is God's change agent in the world to help us to change the world that we have. I love the church. I love being a pastor of a church. I, and and I, I love the church of Jesus Christ. And then we got to come together as church, and we got to quit these little doctrinal differences that we have. I mean, you know, who cares, all right? I mean, I don't care. Do you love Jesus? That's what I want to know. Are you committed to living your life for Jesus? Maybe you baptize a little differently. Maybe you saw we go down to Lake Michigan. You see, if you got a baptistry, you ain't doing it right. Because Jesus didn't baptize anybody. John the Baptist didn't baptize anybody in this little pool out there. He went out to the Jordan River. So if you got a baptistry and you put people under, you ain't doing it right. I'm just teasing you now, all right? Because what do we do? But we, we went to the, for one of the early Christian documents called the Didache. And the Didache, when you baptize somebody, have a class for them first. So we have a class. And then it says, try to baptize them in cold, fresh water. Now, this is not the Bible. This is an early church document written about 100 A.D. And so what we do is we wait till Lake Michigan is cold. And then we go out there and we dip them into that. 
And we do it, but it's in the public. Can you imagine? I mean, just this doesn't count on my time, Pastor. But what you know, can you imagine what it's like when we go down to Chicago's lakefront and here are all these black people, and then they all walk in the water and they let some white guy put them under the water. I mean, it's like that's baptism. What's going on? They come up and want to know. We have fun. Have fun in what you do. All right, church based. But this gives us all of that. Then we got then we got listening to the community. I'm going to do a session on this this afternoon, too. We're going to, they're going to be shortened versions of it, but that, that's the key. Listening to the community. John called it the felt need concept in the early days. We believe in CCDA. I'll say it again later. We believe that the people with the problems, these people living in abject poverty here in Jamaica, they have the best solutions. They know more than the people sitting in the, in the mayor's office or the governor's office or the president's office or whatever offices you got where the big shots are. They know more about the problem. Not in some ivory tower, not in some legislative government body. And if we would only listen to them, it's one of our key core values. Everything that you saw on that screen in that little video, everything was the idea of the people. Listen to we we had our first listening meeting. I'll tell you about our first one. Um, you know what? I'll tell you that this afternoon. All right, we got to keep moving. All right, the holistic approach. The holistic approach is that there's not just one thing. Oftentimes, we as Christians we get focused on one issue. Like it might be, and one, one issue that we're focused on is to help people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what the church is called to do. John said it, he read it, the Great Commission, go into all the world. And you remember the Great Commission, though, doesn't say get people saved, all right? Read it again. It says go into all the world and make disciples. Not get them to say, yes, I love Jesus, and then move on and don't change anything. It says if you want to be my disciple, Jesus says, you got to... Take up your, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross on a daily basis and follow me. That's the kinds of people we want to be making up in our churches. Disciples of Jesus Christ. And so what we see there is that it's a holistic approach. The first, I had a kid on my football team who was, who became a Christian, was coming to Bible study. It was before the days of the church. And he was coming to Bible study, he became a Christian, and he was one of my best football players. He was a middle linebacker. Same thing as Erlacher on the Chicago Bears. Played out there, great football player, and we made the playoffs this year, and so we're getting ready to go into the playoffs, but the playoffs happened between marking periods, between when the grades come out. He got his grades, and he failed every class. I mean, I was so mad at Jeff. Jeff McGee, I was so mad at him. I went and found him. I said, Jeff, you've ruined it. We can't win in the playoffs without you playing middle linebacker. We have no backup for you, and you must not be going to class. I mean, what in the world? You failed every class. And he was a hard worker. He came to practice every day. He always worked very respectful, never gave us any guff. And I was so mad at him. And then Jeff, his face kind of sank. He said, Coach, I know, I'm sorry. I, he, I said, are you going to class? He said, I go every day. I said, Jeff, what's going on? He said, I don't know, coach. I just don't get it. So I went to the teachers. And, I, and the teacher said, yeah, he's respectful. He comes, but his work, he just doesn't get it done right. So we, I said, well, maybe, maybe he's got something wrong. Maybe he's got a learning disability or something. I mean, you know, I didn't know that term back 35 years ago. But I said, nothing's not right because he's a good kid. He comes to class. He wants to do well. He does great on the football field. And he's got a good mind. He remembers the plays. He was the one who called the play. I gave him the signal from the sidelines. He called the play and executed it well. He wasn't dumb. I know he's smart. And I told the teachers that. I said, let's figure out. Finds out he couldn't read. He was more than just dyslexic. He couldn't read. Now, you see what happened? He became a Christian, but he still couldn't read. See, that's what happens. Somebody come, becomes a Christian doesn't mean that every, every problem the rest of their have goes away. And what did Jesus tell me to do? He says, love your neighbor as I love myself. As a daddy, if my kids are failing, what do I do? I get involved in my kid's life, and I'm a good dad. But once in a while, when the church gets involved and maybe starts a tutoring program or sets up a computer lab, people say, churches ain't supposed to do that. Well, our church is supposed to love? Well, then we are supposed to do that. Had another guy who became a Christian on the football team come to Bible study, but his landlord stopped paying. He lived in a 25-unit apartment building. His landlord stopped paying the heating bill, stopped paying people's gas for the heat. 
Pretty soon, in the middle of the winter, they have no heat. And in Chicago, you want heat, all right? You, you got to have heat on those 20 degree below zero days. It's cold, all right? Anybody ever been to Chicago in the winter? It's cold, all right? You, and here these living with no heat. And the landlord, him becoming a Christian, did not make that unchristian, greedy, selfish landlord pay the gas bill, even though he's collecting rent. So you know what? We got involved. I said, okay, I went around to all the families. I said, let's talk to all the families. We had four families in our church at that, in that apartment building out of 24. I said, let's, let's not pay rent this month. Coach, what are you talking about? I said, pay it to us. Let's pay it to the church. We'll give everybody a receipt. Then we'll take all that money. You know, that's thousands of dollars. We'll take money. We'll go pay the gas bill, and then we'll give the landlord that receipt, all right? Let's just do it. Let's just do it. You know, and, 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 and sure enough, he started paying the gas bill, all right? So, you know, you gotta, you got to realize you got to love people in a whole way, all right? That's what we call Not just one. Don't get focused. Now, don't, don't stop telling people about Jesus. Don't stop winning people to Christ. No, we don't stop that, but we love them in a whole way. That's what I'm talking about. All right. Empowerment. Now, we, the one thing we don't do in CCDA is that we don't give people anything, all right? In fact, when I go to churches and they want in, 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 in the United States and they say, we want you to help us do things, and, and you know, we want to love our neighborhood and we want to do all this stuff, please know this may not be true in Jamaica, but in America it's true. They, I said, well, what are you doing? They said, well, the only thing that we're doing kind of creative is every Friday people can come and we give them groceries and we give them bags of groceries. I said, do you charge them anything for it? No, it's free. We just give them free food every Friday. So I said, then I always stop for a moment. I said, do you really want me to tell you what I think? Yeah. You really want me to try to help you? Yes, we do. Oh, yeah, you come all this way. I said, all right, here's what you do. First thing, stop your feeding program. I said, I always ask them, when's the last time you heard anybody starve to death in America? Nobody starves to death in America. Now, we got lots of poor people, but poverty looks different in different areas. Poverty is more of a mental thing often than a physical thing. So I've been to third world countries all over the world. I've been to the Philippines. I've been to Ethiopia. I've been to Kenya. I've been to Egypt. I've been all over the world and seen poverty in all kinds of ways. But you know what? Most of those poor people I've seen in all these other countries don't think they're poor. Most of the people in those countries actually think they, they are doing well and they're happy because it's a mental thing. In America, the American poor are probably one of the worst poor in the world. Why? Because we've beaten them down so much. And we beat them down and we beat them and they've been brainwashed and they feel like they are dirt. We've been telling black people in, you better be glad you ain't got too many white people here in Jamaica because white people love to tell black people they're not as smart as we are. Now that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. And in America, and I know whites that are here, you whites are doing a good job and you're not saying that, but you, I mean, this race thing has messed up America. You can do it better here, I think, than we can do it. Because we have been telling, white people have been telling black people for 400 years they're not as smart as white people are. Now that's ridiculous. But you see, we've got African American poor black people in America. They feel terrible about themselves. You don't shoot somebody that looks like you unless you feel bad about yourself. You just think about that. Empowerment, then, is that we want to come alongside and we want to help people, and we help people to help themselves. And, and, and as we do that, we, we base it on the biblical account of how to do that. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, it starts with uh, John chapter 12. I'll, I'll end with this. John chapter 12, verse 8, Jesus makes a statement. He says, the poor will be with you always. Well, you know what? That verse has really been taken out of context. That was the number one verse quoted to me in the early days of Lawndale. People came up to me all the time and they said, oh, why are you wasting your time on these poor people? Don't you know that Jesus himself even said, the poor will be with you always. Just let them be poor. They're poor because they don't want to be anything other than poor. Well, you know what? I thought, you know, I got mad at Jesus. I don't know if you ever get mad at Jesus. I got mad at Jesus. And I said, Jesus, why would you say that? You know, I'm mad at you. You make my job harder. But he keeps telling me the poor, you're wasting your time. 
So I actually did it the right way. I became a pastor, and then I went on and got a master's degree and got, went to seminary. So I'm in my New Testament exegesis class, and my professor, David Scholler, who, who was at Northern Baptist, and he's at Fuller, he, he said, do a paper, an exegesis paper, on a passage of Scripture that bothers you. Bang! I knew what it was. So I get my little study out. I'm going to tell you, let me, I'm, I, this is kind of a true confession here. This is how lazy a Christian I was. I was, I was even mad at Jesus. But first thing I did, I turned my Bible, and I get to John chapter 12, verse 8, and I look at it, and for the very first time, you know what I did? I looked in the middle of my Bible that had what you call cross-reference. I had never done, I'm only mad at Jesus for saying it. I never figured out where this verse came from. I'd never studied it before. And I looked there, and it says Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. So then I quick go to my Bible, and I find that. And you know what it says? Lord will be with you always. It's a direct quote. But Jesus didn't quote the second half of the verse. It says, therefore, freely open your hand to them. Don't be tight-fisted, but help the poor. Now, Jesus, when he was talking to all those people, and particularly the Pharisees, they had memorized the first five books of the Old Testament. They knew it by heart. They knew what it meant. They didn't have to debate it. They knew Jesus doesn't mean you're not supposed to help poor people because he says that. Then I started studying Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 4 says this, there shall be no poor in your land. In the God's economy with the children of Israel, there would not be any poor people in the land. Then go look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, if only, there's an if clause, if only, there will be no poor people in your land, if only you're careful to do all that I have commanded you. Ah, why do we have poor people in the land? Because of sin. It's, we got a sin problem. We don't have a food problem in the world. Nobody in the world ought to suffer. There's enough food to feed every human being on the face of the earth, but the food doesn't get to the poor, doesn't get to the starving. Why? Because of sin and corruption. We got a sin problem. Then we go on. And then, you know, in case you didn't know it, it says in verse 9, if you don't get care for the poor and your hearts become hard, they can cry out to God and it will be a S-I-N. Sin. It's a sin in the biblical mandate of the Old Testament law not to care for the poor. Now, how do you care for the poor? Two places it tells us. Deuteronomy chapter 24, Leviticus 19. Let me tell you what it says. Deuteronomy 24 says that when you, when you go over and you're, this, they live in an agrarian society. So when you go over and you do your crops, if you go through them and something's not right. So let's just say it's papaya tree. I saw papaya tree today here in Jamaica. I don't have any in Chicago, all right? But I, so, so let's say you're going to go and harvest papayas, and you go, and one of them's not ready to pick. So you go through and you pick all the papayas that are ready, and there's, there's, there's still bunches of them left on the tree. And then you go to pick one, and a good one falls to the ground. The Old Testament law says you cannot go back over the field the next time, and you cannot pick one up off the ground if it falls. And then look what it says. Those are left over for the widow, the orphan, the alien, and the poor. The Leviticus 19 says the same thing. And it's Leviticus 19 says, I'm going to go one step further now. I want to make sure you don't do the corners. So you don't harvest the corners. We want to make sure we have enough food that all the poor in your land can get their needs met. Now, God provided. Now, how does the poor get fed in the Old Testament? The churches or synagogues go out and grab all this food and bring it, and then poor people come to the church or the synagogue, and we give it? No. They got to get out in the field themselves. No, you're right, sister. They get out in the field, and they pick it up, and they bring it home. Can you imagine what happens that we got little Johnny, and Johnny and his dad are out there, and Johnny's mom's got a little baby uh, named Cornisha, and so Mama and Cornisha are at home, and Daddy and Johnny go out into the field, and Daddy says, Johnny, come on, let's go get supper tonight, and let's go over to Farmer Brown down the street. We know he's got some okra over there, and he didn't, you know, he doesn't know how to pick it up very well, and, and so they go over, and they go on a bunch of fields, they go to apple orchards, and they go all around, they get the food, they bring it home. They bring it up, and they say, Mama, look what we got. Little Johnny goes, Mama, look what Daddy and I brought home today. He's excited. Let's cook it up, and we all cook the food together. We have a great meal together, and we're not starving to death. That's how God does it. Now, what is it, how do you do that? Listen to this. Here's your principles of how do you help a poor person in a holistic way that empowers them. Number one, we gotta create opportunities for the poor to have their needs met. 
Secondly, after you get the opportunity, you've got sure that people work for it. In fact, it even says in second, the New Testament version, 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if you don't work, you don't eat. Why are we violating the biblical principle? I don't know. Aren't we biblical Christians? Maybe you all don't love the Bible here the way we do. All right? But we want to do it all by the Bible. You don't work, you don't eat. So the second thing is you got people got to work to get their needs met. And then thirdly, when they do that, it affirms their dignity. How good you feel. You know, you feel good after a good day's work. You feel good after you baked a cake. You feel good after you fried some chicken. You feel good after you painted a room. Whatever it is that we do, when we get done, we often sit back and say, Mmm, looks good. Or, Mmm, tastes good. Whatever it is. We, it affirms who we are as human beings. God created us to work. Don't forget, work is part of God's perfect plan for us because there was work before there was sin. All right, y'all got to go back and study that in Genesis, all right? But holistic approach. We got to love people in a way that helps them, and then we got to empower them along the way, giving them dignity. And so that's the eight key components. And John says, oh, these are, John and I wrote the book, Linking Arms and Linking Lives, Real Hope Chicago. Who is my neighbor is a book on how to figure out who your neighbor is that you're called to love. We may talk about that. I brought some copies of that book uh, over there. And uh, then this Chinese poem. Go to the people, live among them, learn from them, love them. Some people say plan with them. Start with what they know, build on what they have, but the best leaders, when their task is accomplished, their work is done. The people all remark, we have done it ourselves. That's a quick overview of the eight key components of Christian community development. I turn it back over even though I'm longer than I should be. A question about um, the holistic approach. One of the um, items listed was political. I wanted to know uh, exactly what did you mean by the political intervention in a case. You, you listed some cultural, etc. right? Yeah, that's a good question, political. And again, when you flesh these out in Jamaica, they may look a lot different than they look in the United States and even in my neighborhood of North Lawndale, they may look different than in an Asian community or Latino community. But in Chicago, it's, we have a very political city. Nothing gets done in your little, we call them wards, our little neighborhood, if your alderman who is an elected official does not give okay. We can't build a building, we can't do anything. Our alderman can say, no, you're not going to do that. Get a building permit. So we've got to be involved in the political system um, to help keep our political politicians uh, accountable. You know, they are here to serve us, to serve the people. And so we need to be involved in that. I encourage the people of, of our church to vote. We don't tell them who to vote for, but we encourage them to vote. And uh, so I think in, in, a, in America, it's the political system that we've got to be involved in. And of course, President Barack Obama of the United States is from Chicago. He has been to Lawndale. We love him. Okay. And, okay. Yeah, um, living in the community, relocation. Um, I'm thinking, okay, I understand a minister, well, a minister who is working in an area, say an area in Chicago, okay? Um, but he lived in somewhere else, another city of Chicago, or wherever. And because he's full-time, um, he can relocate to whatever. But I'm thinking of somebody, and somebody, for instance, who is not a minister, not, you know, they're not in ministry full-time, but it has a job. What you're saying is the relocation means that you would move from wherever you are, and relocate to live in the particular community. Is that what I mean? Absolutely right. Whether you're a minister or a job downtown <laughs> yes. Chicago or yes. in Jamaica or wherever. Right. Right. And I think um, I'm thinking of some of us. I think some of the issues, there's one issue, I think, for, for me. So for me. Um, I'm married, okay? Um, and I'm sure, definitely sure, my husband wouldn't be relocating from where I am. We are at Worthington Terrace to go to Norman Gardens to live in. Neither would he go to Tivoli. He has to live with me. So you have the issue of you have a, you're married and your partner is not prepared to relocate with you. Um, do you leave him and, you know, issue in front of your How do you deal with that? I'm going to let Dr. Perkins answer that. But the one part I will say, 
don't get a divorce and then relocate. That's not what God wants you to do. Oh, yeah. We're not saying here, we get this straight. We're not saying there is nothing you can do with the poor, for the poor, involved in the poor, if you don't live in the community. We're not saying that. We're saying if you want to do community development, the leadership, the leadership, the people with the great ideas and who are going to be the manager of these resources, they should live there. Now, you who don't live there, what do you do? If you don't want to live there, if you don't feel called, don't go if you're not called. So, so that might help you a little bit. Right now, you have you been called? It seems like you might have been called because you're talking about leaving your husband. And we'll tell you, don't leave your husband. Don't leave your husband and go. But, but the, idea, the idea here, we want leadership. This other leadership is patronizing. We need some leadership to anchor to. We need some leadership. If I'm going to invest some resources somewhere, I want to make certain that my resources are managed to achieve the goal. And if somebody lives somebody else and, and is, and is uh, commuting in, they can't manage the resources. We are not, don't get uptight. Don't go. If God haven't called you to go there. If God have called you to go there, he is, it is possible he might get you there. He, you, you, you get the idea? So, so we're not telling everybody to do that. What you need to do then is get with those people and then empower them. Put your resources with them. Invest through them. Make friends with them. And y'all expand the ministry. So we're not telling you not to invest your resources. We're not telling you not to invest your resources. Raise money for them. Put on parties for them. Do things for the people in that neighborhood. Okay. Uh, one, of, one of the things that we've been able to do is my, my church is located in Jackson in three different communities. Uh, it's in South Jackson. It's in North Jackson. Then we have a location in the inner city. Okay. So the church started in that inner city community. We outgrew that facility. We had the south. So it's, it's, it's like I have one congregation that actually functions in three different communities with people that make up that community all with the same vision. And the whole point is that we're able to pour resources from the north and the south to pour into that inner city community. But I, I think, and I want to be real careful in saying this because these guys, I modeled my ministry years ago, even before I knew them, after this holistic approach. I don't like to say that we don't know the answer. I, I don't really like that, and I say that respectfully. We know, we know that there's a bridge that needs to be built. We've laid down the pilings to build the bridge. We have not yet completed the bridge to build it all the way across. But we have the blueprints for the bridge. If we say that we don't know the answer, then the Bible does have the answer. You can't know the answer. So I think, you know, when we talk about legal relocation, and, uh, it, it's really about raising up a people in those different communities that are able to then carry out what we're talking about doing. And, and the fourth thing is I live in a whole different community. I live out in a rural area. So I don't live, at, live, I live 30 miles away from every one of the communities that my church actually operates in, but it can't be about me. It has to be about those other people that actually are going to live there.